everybody. This is Harriet Kamek, the host of Down to Earth, the show in which we talk about the issues that matter. And today on our show, I want to talk with you about, ready for this, the punishment of women. And now, before you go get excited and start running and saying, oh my God, she is paraphrasing the Bible, or is she misinterpreting the scriptures? Before you do that, let me just inject this. I am taking this straight out of the scriptures from the book of Esther. That's right. Esther is one of the two books of the Bible. There are 66 books, but Esther is one of the two books of the Bible where no reference to God is made. But what happened in this particular story, what happened here that is a type and shadow and provides examples for us is that what? That God used people's imperfections and created a standard and used the imperfections of people so that he could get what he wanted done through people. That's all. So all that it is, is that a very rich man, a very powerful man got drunk one night and decided he wanted his wife to do something she didn't want to do. Sounds familiar. And then when she decided not to do it, he made a decision that had ramifications for the people around them. Now, this took place for a very wealthy man, a very powerful man. And so the decisions that he made had ramifications for those whom he governed. So I want you to go into Esther chapter 1. I know for, uh, for Jews, this is a powerful scripture. And in fact, it is uh, celebrated as part of the month of Purim. It's a holy Jewish festival in which they celebrate this because as you're going to find out what happened through King Xerxes' uh, uh, action was that a thwarting of, of genocide of the Jewish people actually took place. So we're going to get into it in just a moment. I know you're going to enjoy it. So sit back, <laughs> relax, and you're really going to like what comes out of this. Amen. Amen. And I want to talk with you about it because it shows how sometimes we tend to make decisions and we tend to do things without thinking of the long-term ramifications for this. Amen. Amen. Uh, so turn with me in your Bibles to Esther chapter one. But before we do that, I just want to give a shout out to everyone and say, welcome to the Down to Earth podcast. And I want you to know that I am still praying for the people of Gaza. I am still praying that the people of Israel will no longer be attacked and that the people of Gaza will not be attacked. I'm praying for the women and children who are walking endlessly, looking for shelter, looking for health care, looking for food. I pray earnestly that this will stop. I'm also aware of what is happening in Yemen. I'm aware of the persecution of Christians in Pakistan and Nigeria, where people want to worship God. My Facebook friend, Sahil Rajut, keeps impressing upon me how to pray for the people. And I want to pray for you and know that I'm not unaware and that I'm bringing it to attention that Christians are being persecuted the world over. So for those of us who live here in the United States, I can't speak for any other country. I live here in the United States. This is my homeland. This is home for me. I want to say, let us come together and pray for Christians wherever they are and they're being persecuted. Let's pray for people who take all their possessions are in a little bag that they have to walk for hours to find peace. Come on now. Let's pray for people who trek miles and miles to walk, to get fresh water, to get fresh food and vegetables, who have to walk miles and miles and miles. Recently, I read a story on CNN about people in Gaza who walked four hours from North Gaza to South Gaza because Israel told them that they were, the authorities in Israel told them that they're going to, uh, look for Hamas terrorists. And I imagine what a four hour walk is like. Can I just tell you? In my time where I live, four hours from here, it's like about two, you know, it's not that far. It's like a what, three mile trek if I were walking somewhere. I don't even know if I were to walk from here to West Bloomfield, it would take me, what, uh, four hours. I mean, I probably would just start hoofing it and start running, but I'm not escaping persecution. I'm not escaping bombing. You see what I mean? I'm not running because somebody is chasing me out of my homeland. Do you see what I mean? A four hour drive for me, four hours from here is Northwest Indiana, 
Why do I know? Because my daughter went to law school in Northwest Indiana and I used to drive her. So four hours from here is a 250 mile journey to Northwest Indiana. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we need to, when we read these stories, we need to contextualize them and imagine ourselves, kind of superimpose yourself. If it were me, what would it be like? So I just want you to know that those of us around the world who are experiencing wars and who are experiencing dislocation and displacement, we might not be there physically with you, but we are there in spirit. We're praying your strength and praying for your protection from harm. We're praying for you that you will make it out and that somehow God will hear our prayers and he will right the wrong and provide relief from everything that concerns us. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it's just supernaturally that this needs to happen. So I have been going before God and praying earnestly that a supernatural overnight expeditious deliverance will come to your door and will deliver you from everything that ails you, will lift off the heavy burden and put you right smack in the middle of the will of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So let's go into the scriptures. I just want to get into this. It's Esther chapter one. And I know you're going to enjoy reading about King Xerxes. And I know it's going to sound excessive a little bit when you read it, because we're going for most of us, we're like, oh, people really live like that. But yeah, people really did live like that. So this is about King Xerxes, the historical context I'll tell you about in just a minute. It's also King Azirus. That's how it's going to sound like. But in the Greek, it's Xerxes. So when historians put it all together, they found that he's the same king who was the descendant of somebody else. So he has quite the genealogy. But our focus is not on him and his genealogy. Our focus is on what created our door open for Esther to walk in. Amen. So let's go into it. King, it says... In Esther chapter 1 of the New King James Version of the Bible, here's how it reads. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Asuras, this was the Asuras who reigned over 127 provinces. That's key, from India to Ethiopia. So imagine your maps of the world, if you will, and India is way over here, and Ethiopia is in Northeast Africa, right? In those days, when King Ahaz Asuras sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shusan, the citadel. So Shusan, also called Susa, is the place where his kingdom reigns. That's the seat of his kingdom, the seat of his power. That in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Medea, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. So he had this huge feast. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty, for many days, for 180 days. That's six months. Imagine they had a feast for 180 days. So imagine the King of England having a feast for 180 days and he invited the president of the United States who might tell him, bro, I got to go. I have things to have a country to run, right? But imagine being so free that you had six months of vacation time and you could take it all and not worry about how your bills are getting paid. Wow, this king was powerful indeed. People really did live large in those days. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days. So 180 days, they were all gathered and had a feast. And then after the 180 days, they were still feasting for seven more days. Wow, this was what you call a party that was nonstop. And he made a feast lasting seven days for all of the people who were present in the citadel in Shusan, from great to small, in the courts of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains, because that display that shows royalty, right? With cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. This is grand. And the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. Hold on. I missed all of that because I'm not going to redecorate my whole house in those colors. Look at my favorite colors right there. Turquoise. Look at that. Couches of gold and silver. Whoa. And they serve drinks in verse 7. I'm telling you, this is going to make you laugh. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. So you didn't have to drink. 
For so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do each according to his pleasure. So he was like, here, if you want a drink, have a drink. If you don't. Here's where it starts getting interesting. In verse 9, the queen, Queen Vashti, the king's wife, also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Assyrus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded his, his, his advisors. We call them the king's men. Memuman, Bista, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zithar, and Karka, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Assyrus. You know who was a eunuch? A man who could not have sex. Okay, just so you know, right? To bring Queen Vashti before the king. So on the seventh day, while he was merry with wine, after being merry for 180 days, six months of nonstop partying, and he was still partying on the seventh day, he called all his advisors together, who were eunuchs, and he called all of them together and sent for the queen. And he did this, he said he wanted Queen Vashti to come before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti, in her earnestness, refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. And of course, the king was what? Furious. And his anger burned within him. So he said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshena, Shathar, Adama, Tarshish, Merez, Marsena, and Memulkan. Note that one, Memulkan. The seven princes of Persia and Medea who had access to the king's presence. So remember the provinces, 127 provinces from e India, way over here in the far east, to Ethiopia, which is in North, Northeast Africa. And this is what the seven princes said to the king. When the king said, they said, what shall we do to Queen Vashti according to law? Because they know the law. Because she did not obey the command of King Assyrus brought to her by the eunuchs. And Memelkan, the chief one, listen to what he said. He said, he answered before the king and the princes. That's why you have to be careful who is around you. But wait, let me finish this. And Memelkan answered before the king and the princes. Queen Vashti was not only wrong the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in the provinces of King Hasiris. Listen, for the queen's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Hasiris commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come, so I don't have to do that. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, this is Memukan, the chief advisor. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out before him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered that Vashti shall no more come before King Asherus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Are you hearing this? Just because she said no, the one time she said no, and all of a sudden, She's going to lose her royal position, lose everything, and all women are going to be punished because the woman said no. And it goes on to say that when the king's decree actually went out and it pleased the princes, they actually did do exactly that. Father, in the name of Jesus, let me decrease so that you might increase. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. We pray for women today, O oh God, who might find themselves in a position to say no. And we pray for women and children who are always at the hands of poverty, who are always at the extent of public policy, who feel the imprint of public policy. And Lord God Almighty, I pray that there is an overturning now and that men's hearts will come together and realize that women and children suffer the most wherever there is any kind of estrangement, wherever there is any kind of engagement that is negative as it relates to the execution of public policy. Father God, we ask you right now to hover over your people. Bring relief and comfort to those 
who need help. Bring relief and comfort to people, to women and girls and boys and children in war zones who need water and need running water and food and need health care. Lord God, hear the suffering cries of the people and bring an end to violence against women and children. Bring an end to violence and war in war zones. Men who have to stand helplessly and watch as their family systems and structures collapse. Lord God Almighty, stir up peace in our hearts. We ask you and we beg of you right now as you hover over your people and you bring relief in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I wanted some time to go through this seriously because this is really important. I find that in some of the research that I did, that Queen Vashti actually is seen as a feminist icon. I had never thought to look at it from that perspective before. Suffice it to say that I want to examine what happened. And what happened was simply this. In all of the readings that I have done, even in the Midrash, which is a collection of Jewish writings, historical writings, what they surmise that happened is that the king, as you have read, was Mary. Yeah, that's a nice way of saying he was drunk. He was stone cold drunk because he had been merry and drinking and partying for seven months, for six months, 180 days. At the end of that, he was still merry. Some speculate that when he sent for Queen Vashti to come before him. Now, what was happening is that they were so merry that she had a separate uh, grouping for women, which is not unusual because have you ever been to anyone's house? When you go to sit with a, with a world leader, you don't, typically only the, the, the spouses meet together. The wives, they will come together or the, the couples for a photo op, but, or unless it's a state dinner, but typically it's the leaders themselves who meet together. So it's not unusual that the king, having gathered all his henchmen, all the king's men, who were in charge of the provinces and who reported directly to him. When he gathered, the women were sitting where Queen Vashti was and all the men were around the king. So the king was feeling himself, as the young people like to say. They were like, he was feeling himself, yeah? He was, he at that. He was really enjoying his party, enjoying showing off everything. And in so doing, he got so merry and then he became mightier. After all, you're looking around because all the people here, you have power over them. So he's looking around like, I have power over all these people. Anything I want done right now, they can do it. And they will have to do it because if they don't do it, the consequences of them not doing it is greater. So they're going to do what I want to say. So why don't I just bring my wife out? After all, my wife is my wife. So this is what the king is thinking. So he brought, he sent for his wife. Here, here's the thing. He forgot about her own autonomy. He forgot that maybe she didn't want to come at that time. Maybe she and her girlfriends were doing their nails. Maybe they were in a really good session where they were having a spa day. Maybe they were just having a good laugh from attending to the duties of being wives. They, some speculate that she, he might have sent and asked for her to appear naked. Now, in the custom of the time in Persia, women did not go out in public. So pardon the queen for feeling like oh, he's sending for me to appear before all the men. That probably is not a safe place for me to be. What if something happens to me? Would the king defend me? Whatever the dynamics were going on between them, she just said, no, I'm not going to come. Maybe she just felt like, no, I'm just not going to come before you because your friends are out there partying. So I want us to put this in place. You are at home with your husband. And your husband is drinking. They've been drinking and partying all day. And all of a sudden, your husband sends, you know, calls, some, calls for you to come. So you're going to be like, what does he want me for? You're going to say, what do you want? I, you know, you have all the drinks, you have all the food there. It's just you and your friend. So why do you want me out there? You feel some type of way. And many of us have said, no, nah, I can't come right now. I'm in the bathroom or I can't come right now. I'm attending to the kids or I can't come now right now. I'm doing some research. Whatever your excuse might be, you might just feel that's not a good place for me to be. I don't know that I want to go and appear before him because he's drunk. His friends are drunk. And I don't know what if that is a safe place to be. Maybe that's how Queen Vashti was looking at it. So she refused to go. When she refused to go, of course, the king got hot. Now, to be honest with you, maybe if they were by themselves in their, you know, in their, in their apartments and it was just them alone, 
maybe he wouldn't have reacted the way he did. But suffice it to say that he reacted the way he did because what? He reacted because he was surrounded by his friends. Not when you have Memukan, the chief advisor there, trying to tell you what to do. So he reacted negatively. And when he reacted negatively, what happened? The queen refused to go. And when the queen refused to go, what happened? All of a sudden, they're like, oh, so she's denying the king? So can you just imagine? Oh, she's denying the king. How dare her? But if she does that, then my wife is going to... So if all the men just get together and say, no, 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 we can't have that. We can't have that at all. Because if she decides not to go as the queen, then all the other women are going to say no. So what did they do? They passed a law. You know it. Sounds familiar. Yeah. The Supreme Court did that of the United... The Supreme Court of the United States did that recently. Mm -hmm. They passed a law because women decided that we're going to say no. No, we want body autonomy. No, we want to have access to reproductive health because it helps us. We don't want to find ourselves pregnant and go to the doctor and they tell us the only thing you can do because this pregnancy is not viable and so we have to do something about it to save you. Nah, the Supreme Court of the United States run by a group of men who are advisors to the president, who are advisors to the judiciary, who control the law because that's what it says right here. These were the advisors who knew the law and judgments. How many times do women have to sit back and watch as men who have the law and judgments administrate for us? Take away our body autonomy. You want me to come and parade. You give me a title and say, okay, I'm your wife. But as your wife, am I your property? Am I your chattel? Am I a piece of thing to you? Am I not a human being or a person? Can I not choose when I want to have children? What if I want to have just two children? What if I want to have four children? What if I want to say, I don't want to have children after 35. I don't want to have children after I'm 40. What if I choose to say that I don't want to start having children until we're in a place where we are financially comfortable so I don't have any choice? What if I want to say that if we have children and we get married, but you start acting funny, I don't want to be married anymore? So what did Memukan, the chief advisor of the king, do? What do you think he did? He did what all men do. He said, let's pass a law that overturns the rights of women just like we've seen our present time. Do you see what I'm saying? This is why I read the Bible because nothing, as the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Everything that is going to happen has already been. Everything that should happen has happened. There is a way in which it has happened before. So here's what happens. When you look at it all together, there is nothing new. All this punishment of women that we're seeing in our society, I can't talk about your country. I am not as uh, educated, shall we say. I'm not as familiar with the laws that are happening in your country, but I am familiar with what is happening right where I live, right here in the United States. And what I'm seeing is a group of men go into a room and then they make decisions based on what they think it's good for us. That's why I say it's the punishment of women. We continually are being punished. We continually have no rights. And they jump abortion in our faces. I don't want to offend you or anything, but it is not an offensive subject to me because I'm a woman. I, as a woman, have been in the place where I needed reproductive help. I have been in the place where I was pregnant and they had to do something about it because it wasn't viable. So should I have died on an operating table? Should I have died there while they sucked or, or just let the doctor sit there and not take away what was causing me to bleed to death? Is that what you want to happen? That's what is called the punishment of women. No, this is something that we have to talk about because no one wants to talk about it. What about the young child in Tennessee who was raped at 12 years old by her stepfather. Should she have been allowed to carry that child? She has to live with that for the rest of your life because guess what? You don't forget when those things happen to you. Do you see now why we have to have some balance? Because here is a man. The man was drunk like a skunk, as my ex-husband would say, right? He was so merry, he forgot his natural right to rule. His right to rule is to rule for all people make decisions that benefit everyone, 
but not decision that in your redness, you're so angry, you're red, you make a decision and that decision hurts everyone else. It brings to mind that sometimes when I look at marriages today and I look at why are we walking away from good marriages, marriages that can work, it's because somebody got mad. Somebody's ego got in the way and somebody decides that, no, I don't want it this way because it's not working for me and it has to work for me. So you walk away and hurt the women, hurt the children because you got mad and your ego wasn't satiated. That's what happened here. Now, I want you to be clear on this. In this scripture, God is not mentioned. God just kind of sat back and watched the humans make their decisions and do all they do. And when they had made all the decisions that they made, he said, you know what? Coming down the road, I can see a genocide of the Jewish people coming. So I'm going to, oops, move one uh, ruler out of the way and put someone else in there to make it. That's the only time God entered the picture. This was God letting us see how when he steps out of everything, he leaves humans to run this ship. And when they ran the ship, what happened? Women were punished. So I want to ask you this question. The question is this. Do you, as a man, see women as part of creation? Do you believe that women are human beings? Do you believe that the same force who created you also created women? Or do you think women are a little above animals? Yeah? Because that question is central to how women are treated. Women are mistreated continually in our relationships in the boardrooms. We are mistreated in our relationships in the courtroom. We are mistreated in our relationships in the bedroom. Why? Because this central tenet exists. Do men believe that women were created by the same force that created them? Or do you see women as less than? Because if you continue to see women as less than, then we're going to continue to see the punishment of women evidenced by the laws that we pass around. So what next? What are we going to do next? What are we going to do? Here's the thing. We must come together and recognize that there are two types of people on the planet, male and female, two only human beings. The only human beings exist on the planet come like this. Your wife whom you chose, your daughter, your mistress, your girlfriend, the woman who works as your vice president. She's not an animal. She's not something beneath you. She's a human being who is deserving of the same considerations that you would give yourself. And if we start thinking like that, then it's going to negate the punishment of women. Amen. Let me just pray in the next few seconds. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this message gets to someone and that it changes their heart as it relates to their marriage, changes their heart as it relates to the women who work for them, and that as a society, we begin to grasp and um, answer the question, are women as equal as men? In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, everybody.